So this morning, someone is entitled gone. It is entitled gone. Now, as you would suspect, we will be looking at a lot of scriptures. So the scriptures will be on the screen, and if you miss anything, I can send it to you. Let's go ahead and stop praying. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for having us in your presence once more. I pray that, Father, that as we are about to go through this message, that the Holy Spirit will speak to us, and that we will be able to live our lives as changed individuals. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, time is a time to be a person's greatest enemy or the greatest ally. Time reveals, time creates, and time destroys. So for some persons, they may have been broken by a situation in their life. And time is the healer. But for other people, they may get into a situation in their life and the situation turns out to reveal that they put themselves in a bad situation in the first place. And we see that happening all the time, all around us. So time can be some people's greatest friend and some people's greatest enemy. Endurance is one of the greatest tests of the Christian. Now many are baptized or raised in the church. They, re they religiously attend church Sabbath after Sabbath, but I don't really want to say that because I have that in there. But some people just come to church every Saturday. Right? They are, ha they are active, they are highly active in church, and they are quite knowledgeable on the world. But then a few years pass and you are no more. And nowadays the cycle is not even near, the cycle is months. So persons get baptized and within three months, four months, they disappear and nobody knows what happened to them. They just disappear. So if you see Acts chapter 9, verse 11, the scripture that many people know but yet do not know. It says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happening to them all. Now I need to know that scripture, but that scripture that you know is actually a merge between this scripture and the words of Jesus, right? Now, Ecclesiastes 9, 11, the message Bible renders it like this. So it's a different translation. And it says, I took another walk on ground in the neighborhood and realized that on this earth it is, the race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor satisfaction to the wise, nor riches to the smart, nor grace to the learning. Sooner or later, bad luck hits us all. The Bible tells us that our experiences in life is not of the fittest. Time and chance, and chances about randomness, is always waiting at the door. But what does chance mean? Because the Bible says, the scripture writer says that time and chance happen to us all. So I explain time, so now let me explain what chance is all about. So 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 34, in the ESU says, but a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate. Therefore he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and carry me out of the battle, for I am wounded. And the battle continued that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians, until a evening he died, and the blood of the wound flowed into the bottom of the chariot. Right now, in KJV, it says that random adventure. Right? Or innocence in the Hebrew. Now, King Ahab was a wicked king of Israel. He allowed Jezebel to lead Israel into great sin. Ahab went into battle disguised. I want you to pay attention to that. The man of God, the man who was leading God's people, and who was supposed to be a man of God, he went into battle disguised. And the man was responsible for leading God's people was hit by a random stray bull. 
many lessons to be learned here. How does Ahab's death parallel with modern day Christians? In other words, how many Christians, Seventh-day Adventists, have been disguised on the battlefield and have been taken out? How many have left God of church because of a strict war of religion? What we learn here is that by chance, someone wounded in battle and ultimately succumbed to their injuries. So many people are taken by seemingly random situations. Now, of course, God is, of course, God allowed him to die. And there's nothing out of God's control. Now, the sodium pulled that string to release that bow. So, sorry, to release that arrow. Did not intend to hit the king. He did not even know that was the king. But God allowed the bull to hit him. But Sir of Ecclesiastes 9 says, For man also knoweth, not at this time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net. You think fishes want to be caught in a net? And as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. So the scripture here is saying that evil suddenly befalls a Christian. It's not just something, it just comes. Matthew 10, 22. And ye shall be made of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Endurance is part of the key to the Christian experience, but endurance must be driven by love. Endurance must be driven by love. James chapter 1 verse 12 said, says, Blessed or blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he was stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. When God promised to those who love him. Now, we are probably so far removed from the days of the martyrs. But what they went through, these men endured. And these men endured so much that in, in, a, in some cases, the very executioners who were supposed to kill the men actually converted to Christianity. And these men endured, and, and God said that there's a crown of righteousness laid up in heaven for all of those of us who endured. Now, some members deconvert. And deconvert means that they leave religion. And, and atheists will often talk about deconversion, they, they left religion. That some Christians, some members, but others were never converted in the first place. So there are members who come to church from small, baby, infant, all their life, but they were never converted. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10, 13. Another parable he put forth saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. That would manage Jesus. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tears also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? And of course, the failure is representing the church. How then does it have tears? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather the tears, you all shall go to the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tears and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now what is being said is that there are people planted in church and Satan is the one who planted them in the church. That is what the scripture is saying. And if you don't have to know, we know that you are just planted in the church and that's one aspect of it. But there are people who look ordinary, the people who are elders, deacons, whatever, or people who just come to church. And there are people who have been sent by Satan to destroy the church. Their goal and their aim, whether they go or not, 
is to cause mischief in the house of God. They do not even know God. What's interesting is that the passage says that these people are planted while men slept. When we see people sleeping in the church, don't look around. I don't mean literally. Right? Matthew chapter 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their dresses with their lamps. But this is the word verse 5 says, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and said, so the wise virgins were sleeping, and the foolish virgins were sleeping. All ten were sleeping. And while we seven years were sleeping, that is when the enemy came and sang his people in the church. So may I submit to you that there are four classes of people in the church, which I want to have just described. There are wise sleepers, number one. There are foolish sleepers. And there are tears. Now you can say to me and you argue with me that the foolish sleepers are tears, but I will show that they are not. And there are watchers, that's the full class. Right? Now in verse 6 of chapter 25, we hear that someone makes a Lord cry that the bride groom is coming. Clearly, this person has to be on the lookout to some degree. The two classes of watchers represent the two classes who profess to be waiting for the Lord. They are called virgins because they profess a pure faith. By the lamp is represented the word of God. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The class, and listen to this now, the class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated for the truth. They are attached, they are attracted to those who believe in the truth. But they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's work. So the tears and, and, the, and the foolish sleepers are not the same. Matthew chapter 13, verse 36 to 43 explains the parable of the wheat and the tears, or weeds, and what it means. Christ sows good seeds. The field is the world here. The good seeds are God's people. And these are the sons of Satan. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. The work of the angels are seen in the first phase of the investigative judgment. And I wish of someone about that. Not last time, but time before that. We know by the time she just returns the second time that probation will be closed. Revelation 22, 11 says, He who is just, let him be, let he, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. Who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Now this means that by the time Jesus returns, everybody's faith will be sealed. Now people will continue to live on the bus, either under perfection, or under waiting for eternal damnation. So people must live on earth without sin. You can't even tell what you say, what people like to say a little lie. Completely without sin. That is the state you have to live under. So how does God deal with, pain, with tears and the foolish virgins of the church? Before he returns, he must do something. And this is where the passage comes in. So I'll ask you to read it together. After the point of two, Isaiah chapter 17, verse 4 to 7. One. If you can't see me, you might have to look at it in your Bibles. One, two.
come to pass. The glory of Jacob made thin. The glory of Jacob made thin, and the fatness of flesh made the lean represent the current state of the church, a slow period of progression. The olive tree represents the church, and the olive tree has many purposes. It is a source of it is a source of food. It is used to make furniture. It is medicinal. It is all used for anointing, sacrificing, and for lambs in spiritual things in all. The olive tree produces beautiful flowers. On one occasion, the trees wanted a king to rule over them. So they came to the olive tree to be their ruler. But the olive tree said no. The tree knew that it was much better than that. I know I did not make up that story last year when I wrote this. That's from Judges chapter 9, verse 8 to 10. Right? And the story goes on to tell us about, you know, they went to the fig tree, the fig tree said no, the vine said no, and eventually the ground was the ground was said yes. The ground was already ground. Um, the church is here to solve all facets of society. So in the passage above, why does the body tree need to be shaken? Remember, we talk in spiritual things. The olive tree represents the church. So what I'm really saying, and not really me, but what the Lord is saying, is that the church needs to be shaken. The Lord does not know what to bring many souls into the truth because of the church members who have never been converted. And those who are once converted but have that sin. So you see, when I said earlier on that some people come to church on the that and not convert, I didn't make it up. The Lord told Sister why that. So I read again. The Lord does not know what to bring many souls into the truth. Because of the church members who have never been converted. How could someone be in church on this year, seven years, ten years, fifteen years, and they're not converted? And those who are once converted, so you see an extra there are people who are converted, but they but they are back still. The aim of the shaking is to produce a remnant. The remnant is the last and very small part of a piece of cloth. The tears of our weeds or useless to the church. Similarly, the useless berry must be shaken off. So two or three berries in the top of the uttermost bowl, four or five for the uttermost fruit branches, is talking about producing a remnant. Only a few will remain. Those who remain steadfast, those who will endure. So we know now that it has not been established that God's church, people must leave. And not just the case where people must leave, people must leave in mass, in large numbers, so that God's work can be accomplished. But how does that happen? 2 Peter 3 17 gives us one of the ways. It says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Lawlessness is one of the ways, is one of the means by which people are shaken out of the church. Obviously, those who are not grounded in Christ's love will be inspired by us and swept away by lawlessness. New ideas and ways of thinking, contrary to God's love, in what ways? Accepting the LGBTQI plus agenda, modern feminism, pro-choice or abortion agenda, political activism, protests here, there and everywhere. These are the things that, that, will, that can lead people out of God's church and to lead people out. In Numbers chapter 16, and I'm reading from the ERD, we read of Korah, Dagon, and Abraham. They were not pleased with Moses' leadership. They thought they had a better way, and after all their fighting, the God opened up and swallowed them up together with their possession. 250 men were also consumed by fire. Sometimes I visualize. 
So I don't know what you think is your life. I told you that it's the end of life. For me, me. Let this be a lesson for those who believe they have been better way of running God's church. Now, there are some individuals, and all over the place, they always believe they give they no better. They don't call the church to be right. And every time they have a suggestion or critique, so there are some people you almost never hear them say from any people that go to church. Everything in the church is wrong. Right. And everything in the church is wrong. And they can they clearly give their compliments about the church. Or, or compliment the members or give some encouraging word. Right? So I don't know, I, I've never read about the spirit of Jesus. I don't know where that comes from. I don't know what that means. But, 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 but um, God has taken away for his church children. And, and even though we this, even if we don't agree with what we be going on, it does not give us the authority to know in our own way to deal with, with matters. There's some people they don't need to untie and they don't give up for because they don't like what the church is going on and how the conference is running. That's not your basis. You are responsible to God. And if, 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 if administrators or the elders or the pastors or whoever is doing um, their stuff, if you read the Bible, God will hold them accountable. But you are not God. You cannot be telling me in your own way that I'm not going to attend church, I'm not going to support it because I do not agree. We have seen time and time again that God has used even circumstances to, to go against that circumstances that when they seem to appear to go against him and his word has spread. And so as modern day Christians and as, as people who are seen to be very uh, highly educated, we always feel that you know, we can protest against the church. As if the church is you not know, this is not empty. And we just protest. Right? Now, in some anime, you know, we live in a Christian nation, um, as they say, you know, you, you, there are things that you hear, and, and, some, and sometimes I believe you are so happy and we are so free. There's no other system in the world that gives this freedom. You try to say anything in this country, you are in prison one time. You have to protest against the government. It's not in these three countries. You can't try to do this way. Only countries that allow these kind of things are countries that claim on Christianity. But it's clear to respect God to some reason. And, and because of that mentality that we have, this idea of freedom of speech, we always believe that we can always exercise this freedom. And sometimes you're not fighting against man, you're fighting against God. So they thought they had a better way. Yes, there is a way to dress, yes, there is a way to speak. Mr. White says, it is a song statement. It is a song statement that I have to It is a song statement that I made to the church. That not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close the earthly history and would be as very without God and without hope in the world as a common sinner. Not one. Those who have had opportunities to hear and receive of the truth and who have united with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, calling themselves commandments, keeping the people of God, and yet possess no more vital, vitality and consecration to God than to the nominal churches will receive the place of God just as very as the churches who oppose the Lord God. So in other words, the unconverted church members will receive the same seven as faith as some believers who never want anything to do with God. Now God does not work on a credit based system. All tears and foolish virgins will receive of the seven as faith. The same way the sun worshippers, and as S to them, sun worshippers will receive during the final event of this sinful world. There's no years of service to God. There's no family heritage, no ordination, no certification, no being invested in anything in a in no honors, no time returning, we fear the sharp, which are with our tears. None of these things will get anybody to heaven. Persecution is the agent that purifies and revives God's church. We need to be persecuted. If we're not persecuted, we do nothing. And that's 
endless right now. <laughs> moss, it is some moss. Some people don't like to hear it, but that is the way. In our time, persecution and prosecution over Sabbath worship will, will see in the absence of the persecution, all of what we need to survive, of the persecution, they have drifted into our ranks men who appear strong and in Christianity unquestionable, but who, if persecution should arise, will go all from us, and we will go out. Persecution gets rid of the fakers and those who are not here for the right. Persecution gets the rest to work. So we need to be persecuted. And as black people, it seems like maybe we have to be beaten to something, and it's Christianity in general. So that is the only way. Right? And, and we are living in, in simpler times now, but most of the, the Christian church, if you look at God's people, the vast majority of the time you know, they expect is suffering and, and death and their lives are obstructed. Right? And if you look at episodes, the church grew many times over only when persecution came. It's only when they were persecuted in Jerusalem that's when the gospel spread because they were seeking to see Jerusalem. God will use the same method in the last days. Don't forget anything I say. I want you to remember this one. It says, for preachers and prophets, the Lord often employs his bitterest enemies to punish the unfaithfulness of his professed people. The Lord often employs his bitterest enemies to punish the unfaithfulness of his professed people. Now, how would God use his most, the people that hate God the most? Is the same people God used to punish his own people. Now, I don't know what example I can bring about to the to try to understand that. I'm not part of the city leader, and I don't know if politicians use the God that needs to punish the people that I don't know. Because they need to pray. I don't know. But whatever the case is, I look to God for an idea. When King Ahab Khan came, he was taken on by Iran the Bull. Many said that they are simply not consecrated to God. The basis of prayer, study, meditation, lifestyle, and witnessing on are lacking. Our experience with God as a people is probably near non existent. We often wonder, and I will put in quotation marks, why young people leave the church. Why do entire families leave? How could it be that they were sickly or shaken up? The Lord does not know what to remain associated with the truth because of the church members who have never been converted. If some outsiders were to come to the church today, would you or me be a reason for the quick disappearance? When you come to church with gossipers, sexual predators, fraud finders, fashionistas, devote political activists, philosophers, uncompassionate members, and, and so on, how quickly would someone leave? 2 Peter 3 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some come slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not only that any should perish, but that all to come to repentance. God's aim is not to send people to hell. And I would argue that God does not send anybody to hell. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5, 4 and 5 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that he should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Now let me bring this scripture down so everybody understands exactly what the pastor is saying. Right? Now if I give somebody a map, and let's say you want to get to Greenville, I give you the map and take the map. And you decide on your own account that you're not looking at no map and you try to you want. Whose fault is that? It is your fault because you're given the map. In other words, I predestined you to get to Greenville. But you did otherwise. So God did not give us a map to go to hell. He gave us a map to go to heaven. So anything or alternative to that is us deviating from that map and doing what we want. Yeah. 
The straight testimony is what will cause the other tree to be shaken. There is not a, that is not a threat, but a warning. When we do not even love, sorry, when we do not love truth, then the only other option is to fall by the wayside. Sister White says, the great issue so near at hand, the full sense of Sunday law she's talking about, will weed out those who God has not appointed, and he will have a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter week. The church may appear to fall, may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be simply out. The sharp separated from the precious week. This is a terrible ordeal, but not, nevertheless, it must take place. She says the broken ranks will be filled by those represented by Christ as coming in the eleventh hour. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgment is a time of mercy for those who are now, who now have opportunity to learn what is true. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart is mercy, his heart of mercy is touched. His hand is still stretched out to save while the door is closed. To those who will not enter. Large numbers will be admitted who in the last days hear the truth of the first time. I think that you have a special position in church and you can't lose it. I just see it in the news. So in other words, it must be serious. It must be, it must be, it must be serious. Right? And you must, and you must understand that God is feeding with us on our, for our own sake. Because God wants our good. You know, and, and we look, when we look at, at, at how things are running today, you know, it, it is a harsh reality. Now, I don't know why I'm about to say this. I didn't plan to say it. As a matter of fact, that was supposed to be so much. We don't know. But, but I, I, I probably have to say it because the whole time I'm there and I'm thinking about it. So, the, the, the world has a higher standard than, 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 than sometimes even the families of the church. Sometimes we see children just they, they get past the age of education age, and all of a sudden the CSR changes, the mood of dress changes. And I have to contemplate myself. So you need to tell me that, Tom, CSR is your whatever part you to. If you had a room with you, can dress like this on the CSR, like that, you would obey. So the children are really the parents, but the school is the standard because if they had the opportunity to go to secondary school, they would have done it. And that's something that, that is all that I, I constantly think about. So you see here that we have to get back to a place of, 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 of true godliness. You know, and, and like I said earlier on, anyone, anybody who comes to church on a Saturday, and when I make that statement, people. People do not come to church on Sabbath because Sabbath is a sacred day. Some people come to church on Saturday, it is a lying place. And after the Sabbath, after they leave the church service on Saturday, they go home and do what they want. So they did not keep the Sabbath holy. And Friday night they were not keeping the Sabbath holy, so they only come to church on Saturday. So we look at that and we say, okay, what is happening there? And over the years, I've heard stories about many people saying, you know, somebody something preaching and the old children in the congregation are saying, we don't do that and we don't do this and that. And it goes to show that we are in a state where there's a lot of talking, a lot of talking, but there's, there's no action in the home. And it's, it all starts with the family. So sometimes, and I think I was telling my mother that some time ago, that sometimes, and I said to the summer, sometimes when people were never in church, yet they came to church Saturday after Saturday. But at home, it was lacking. It wasn't there. It was zero. It was zero. Okay. And so when we get back to that place of, of looking for truth and devoting ourselves to Christ, 
and pray and asking God for his Holy Spirit, then we will have functional churches again. Then we will have functional families. Right? The church is not a place for instant coffee. No, I don't know. Everything everybody wants to pay, everything is instant money. So we must get back to that place of prayer. And there's nothing stopping anybody from all you have to do is just do it. Just get down and pray. Amen. Amen. There's nothing, you don't have to go to university for that. You don't have to come here for that. All you have to do is pray. In this modern day and age, I do not understand how some people do do certain things. The internet is there to do research. To sit here, one and the others, you all have to read books and so on. Today, right? You all have to read books and, and, and if you didn't have to teach us someone, I have to do research, you have to maybe find somebody with a, a commentary. None of that is online. And we are living in a church with a whole bunch of educated people and people told to know something must be wrong. You must know. And when you want to know, you research. And nowadays, it is even better if you want to do charity. So you want to find out if the same people are going to do some charity. It will tell you. It's as simple as that. So we must know. We must know. And if we don't know, it is not anybody's fault, it is our fault. And often, and this is my last one, because I see the time. I often look at church as being reflective. Sometimes I believe that the members reflect the leaders and the leaders reflect the church. So if, if members of the church are studying the word of God and they see this difficulty, for example, the question about being Jesus was black or not. If the a group of people, if the church is really dedicated to that and people are studying the word, it should force not the students, it should force the leaders of the church to study. So if the leaders are not studying, they will study. And then the leaders should be bringing new things to the church, or not new things, but bringing truth to the church so that it encourages the church to study. So it is a two-way street. Brethren, today, God is speaking with us. If you are indifferent to the church, if you were planted by Satan, whether you know or not, if you lost your first love, whatever it is, Jesus has given you the opportunity to change. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, and that's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. God is calling all of us to repent and see endurance and to love. Now, many a times before, and I said it earlier on, when the martyrs were dying, in some cases, jailers. In one case, 6,660 men decided that they were not going to kill the Christians, and all 6,660 men um, lost their lives because of that. So, it doesn't matter what it is. Change can happen now. So even if a person, you or myself, we are not serious about God's word, we can get serious today. We do not have to be shaken up. The ball is in our court. Amen. 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 Amen